Hey out there, today is Monday, November 16th, 2020. My name is Matt Fury, and you are listening to The Rough Cut. Okay, hey there. Me again. Nice to see you. How was your week? Now, before we get things underway, I just want to say thanks to all of you that took the time to reach out last week via social media or email about our episode with Michelle Tesoro for The Queen's Gambit. After posting that episode, it was immediately obvious, although not at all surprising, that people are absolutely nuts about that series. You know, it just struck a nerve in a way that few things have this year. And like I was saying in the podcast, I would be shocked if it did not get some serious attention when it's time to hand out some trophies. So I'm glad we got a chance to talk with Michelle and get the lowdown on The Queen's Gambit. And all that happened thanks, in part, to our sponsor, Extreme Music. Since 1997, Extreme Music has been the one that music supervisors turn to for the fiercest production audio ever. All easily searchable by pretty much any kind of metadata. You know, keyword, vibe, genre, composer, beats per minute, even lyrics. Once there, you'll find a top-shelf catalog of fully rights-cleared music powered by A-list talent. You can audition and license tracks right there on their website or with a little help from one of their reps through a live chat or direct from their many offices all over the world. So when it's time to start your next project, start things off right with Extreme Music. Okay, time for what we're going to call our TED Talk. Ted Lasso, that is. What's Ted Lasso? Who's Ted Lasso? Well, since I donate to Wikipedia, I think I'll paraphrase what they have to say. Ted Lasso is an Apple TV Plus series that was developed by Jason Sudeikis, Bill Lawrence, Joe Kelly, and Brendan Hunt. It's based on a character of the same name that Sudeikis first portrayed in a series of promos for NBC Sports coverage of the English Premier League. See, the premise is that an American college football coach, Ted Lasso, is recruited to coach an English Premier League team, AFC Richmond, despite having no experience in English football for which I will refer to from here on out as soccer. So if this guy knows nothing about soccer, why hire him as a coach? Well, it seems the team is now under the control of Rebecca Welton, the jilted ex-wife of its original owner. Aided by her assistant Higgins, her plan is to destroy the team's chances of ever winning anything, just despite the ex-husband who loves that team more than he ever loved her. Apparently, she thinks bringing in a guy who knows nothing about soccer would be a great way to make that happen. It is not going to be easy for Ted. Despite his exceedingly good nature, he's dealing with some personal stuff at home and in the locker room. His two star players hate each other. Roy Kent is the aging vet whose body can't keep up with his will anymore. And Jamie Tart is the up-and-coming prima donna who forever puts himself above the team. So, to oversimplify the whole thing, it's a fish-out-of-water series. More aptly put, it's a goldfish-out-of-water series. That's a little joke you'd get if you watch the series, and if you don't, you really should. Maybe it's a case of the right show at the right time, but Ted Lasso and his relentless optimism could not have come along at a better point in our lives. You just can't help but cheer for this guy and his ability to bring out the best of people, even in the worst situations. Now, as you might imagine, to create such a fun show, you need really fun people, especially in the editing room where we know that it all comes together. Our good friends Melissa McCoy and AJ Catiline are the driving editorial force behind Coach Ted Lasso and his I Believe mentality. And I'm happy to welcome them into the Rough Cut locker room for a little pregame warm up. Here are AJ and Melissa. Somewhere in the series, he was described by somebody as a metaphorical Saint Bernard. I could be remembering that wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's a perfectly apt. And something that comes up a lot on these interviews are tone meetings, which was a new thing for me. Do you have tone meetings on Ted Lasso? And what, what things do you look out for in terms of the tone of the show? We didn't have any tone meetings. I actually, in the beginning, was like, oh, I really could use a tone meeting, like when I was doing the pilot, because I was, you know, you watch the commercials, and I was getting this material back. And I was like, this isn't quite a laugh out loud 30 rock. And I knew that from reading the pilot, like we were going to get really emotional at the end. So it was, yeah, that was a very fine line of like, well, we can't let the comedy get too broad and too out there because then when we have those really real moments in the episodes, we want them to hit really real. So that was a fine line. And I remember one of the jokes that was in and out in the pilot was Rebecca and Ted are walking through the hallway and they're talking about the different pieces of the the history of the team. And she says like, oh, some people think that the pitch is haunted. And uh, he goes, oh, spooky. And she goes, oh, do you believe in ghosts, Ted? And he goes, 
I do, but more importantly, I want them to believe in themselves. And we went back and forth on that joke, coming off too dumb or, you know, like, is that something we should play into? Like, does he really believe in ghosts? But ultimately, like, it was just, he knows. He's just kind of like making a joke in that moment. And so we ultimately kept it in because it was a really funny joke and a really positive <laughs> Ted Lassoism. Like, ghosts need to believe in themselves too. But yeah, so we, we talked a lot about the tone of Ted and when to make him silly and out there and when to make him real. So you kind of play the unsuspecting depth of Ted in a lot of different places. Yeah, I agree. The The tone meetings came in, in the cutting room uh, later on and first with, with Bill Lawrence because he was coming back from London from being on set. So Jason didn't get involved. We didn't, we didn't even connect and meet with Jason until, uh, until January when, you know, he had a chance to, uh, you know, take a break and come, come to the edit room. But with Bill, yes, you know, he wanted us to cut, you know, all the sort of goofy moments of Ted and, and have those available. But then it became a matter of, you know, pulling back a bit and not making Ted too broad so that we reveal that there's more to this character underneath. Because I think with Mel, with those initial first weeks of editing, we would, you know, emerge from our cutting rooms and have lunch together as a crew. And we were like, you know, this, this isn't a traditional comedy that we're working on here, Mel. This is, this, it's, there's something deeper here. So, you know, for me, the first episode was, was 102 because Mel and I, you know, alternated odd and even episodes for the most part. In 102, there was you know, that one of the first scenes they filmed in that episode was the scene with uh, Ted and Rebecca in the office where, you know, he comes into the episode's called Biscuits and he establishes a tradition of bringing her biscuits every morning. And he's kind of just slowly starting to, to needle this woman and drive her more and more mad. But in, the method to his madness is he's bringing, you know, her out of her shell and, and getting her to, to be her best self, you know, and, and Hannah Waddingham is amazing. So that first scene, they had a great moment in there where he's doing things that are just not in the script that they must have discovered uh, on the set when he sings to her, you know, he talks to you like, tell me, tell me what is your, your first concert and your best concert. Ted uh, talks about, um, you know, Kenny Rogers, and he, he sings to her The Gambler in a great bit of improv. So it's very, uh, it's very silly. Um, and, you know, and he's pushing her buttons. But then later in that uh, episode, there's, uh, there was a moment there which uh, went around a lot in editing the, the scene uh, where we introduced the concept of be a goldfish, you know, which t- Ted says to the young uh, striker from, uh, from Kenya, Sam Obasanya, uh, he says to him, you know, what's the animal that has the shortest memory? You know, meaning, you know, if you make a mistake, move on, you know, live in the moment. And he says, it's a goldfish. So be a goldfish, Sam. And then there's this awkward pause in there where it lands on him. And Bill and I played with that so many times. Some days we would come in and add six frames to it. And then we'd take away eight frames until we just felt we had that exact long enough pause. So it's comical, but you realize that there's a there's a moment there which is is uh, is deeper. And working with Jason is just uh, someone who has just has amazing you know, improv skills, and it's so fun to edit those moments. Well, so that is something I did want to ask you about, and that is the improv element of the show. Clearly, the writing's really strong, and there's great scripts. You can actually download some of the scripts. I have one here. But because of certainly Jason and some of the other actors, their experience and their skill sets, is there a lot of improv that goes on in these scenes? There was a fair amount. They would, you know, run a scene and do it as scripted. And then there would be one scene where it would just be like, you know, we'd put markers <laughs> and they would just keep running the same joke, but with different punchlines or different setups and stuff. And sometimes Jason would be like, wait, wait, what was that thing? And you'd see him like look through the script of what, what have we written down? And I would always watch all of my dailies because ultimately you'd see Jason run in and like workshop in, in like a break, they'd keep the camera running and you'd see him run in. Like uh, there was a scene where Hannah and Keely are talking and this might be a little vulgar, but she goes, what men give, uh, men give each other jobs in the toilet all the time. And you know, Oh, job jobs. <laughs> and she was like, Oh, so not hand or blow or foot. And Hannah goes foot. And Keely's, Oh, that's right. It would be feet. And she lifts her hands up and makes the motion that was a last take. Jason ran in and I, and like, you can't hear, like, I couldn't hear what they were talking about. They had cut the mics, but I see Jason do the hand movement. And then, uh, Keely, she like laughs and gets it. And so I was like, Oh, well that's going in like that whole moment. They just kind of created in a break between, you know, a rolling restart. So. And for those of you following along at home that can't see Melissa minding yeah. this, please, please watch Dead Lasso. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. yeah. Episode five, I believe. Episode five, early in yeah. the episode. <laughs> yeah. We're not allowed to talk that way at work anymore now. So, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Which is uh, which is another great, awesome improv line. Exactly. Uh, that. When Rebecca said Ted had a master stroke of coaching. Uh, so it's so many that, you know, that's the, the, the best part of, about working with high energy, awesome uh, actor like Jason Sudeikis is you're going to be so surprised as an editor. You've read the script and you're used, you're prepared for the jokes that are coming down the pipe. But when you're, when you're watching the dailies for the first time and these jokes just come at you, it's just a laugh out loud riot. And I think it's as important as an editor to remember, you know, your reaction to that comedy. Cause you know, if it's gold, you know, how you react to it the first time, you know, you remember it. And I think uh, things that stay in the script and people continue to laugh at every single viewing after the, the 200th screening, uh, you know, you know that it's gold. And I will give a shout out to uh, Avid Media Composer and Avid Surf Sync Tool is just, I don't know how we could do comedy without it because, uh, you know, of course, we can have access to all the different reads of a line so quickly. But uh, uh, my assistant editor, Alex Sabo, developed an interesting color coding method uh, of improv so I could go through the script and find a lot of that uh, improv and, ha and have it at the ready. So I think in our case, the workflow became to to have all these options, uh, you know, on standby. So we could show, you know, Jason, you know, what actors could, you know, could say. For me, the two great pieces of improv I'll just mention that are good for viewers to know about uh, in, in the finale, uh, Ted gets very excited and uh, he runs out of Rebecca's office and mistimes the leap as he's uh, running out of the office and smashes his head into the door. And that is not visual effects, that's real. That had to be the last take because they had to check Jason. Uh, he said that he really hit his head and the set medic had to take a look at him. But, you know, we absolutely knew that that take had to go in uh, the show. So, and that, so that was real performance on everybody's part. Uh, <laughs> and then I think also a great piece of improv for me was cutting the Alan Iverson scene in, in 106, which um, it's a homage to the speech that practice. Alan gives. Yeah, practice. The, we set up this... Uh, motif early in the episode called semantic satiation, which is where you repeat a word over and over again. And, you know, Ted's like, plan? I have a plan, plan, plan. And then the word becomes um, nothing. So, or it, we, it loses its meaning. So that became uh, a motif to set that up and to repeat the word as many times. But Jason surprised everybody. Apparently he came into to set the day before with those script pages and wanted to do that Iverson bit. Well, there's some similarities to your careers, to your backgrounds, but I don't believe you've ever worked together before. Am I mistaken or is mm -hmm. it the first time? No. So when you're working together on a show, when editors are working together on a show for the first time, what is that initial process of getting to know one another? What discussions do you have about the show? What's the, what's the get to know you mm -hmm. for Ted Lasso? It was a hit the ground running because I was knee deep in the pilot mm -hmm. by the time you came yeah. in. And I was just like, and we were kind of figuring it out still, you know, the episodes were a little long and everybody was in London. So it was just kind of like the post team was back in LA. So yeah, there was a lot of like music. I was thinking back about, I remember we were going back and forth about what, what's the sound of Ted Lasso. And I had uh, temped the, the pilot with Birdman, like a drum thing. Cause it was, I was like, you know what, let's go minimal. And we didn't know Marcus Mumford was going to do the score yeah, yet. We didn't know yeah. that until like episode five. So it was like a lot of music discussions. Like uh, and I remember AJ being like, uh, we we're talking about needle drops. Mm -hmm. Like, are we going to do a British? Mm -hmm. Are we going to say British? Are we going to, and we were rolling around a lot of that. I remember you were like, oh, we should bring in some Morrissey. Like we were just making, like we were bonding. Yeah, let's go nuts. <laughs> we kind of went big because nobody was telling us not to. And Kip, you know, RAP was like, let's just go. Let's, let's play because now is the time. So we were really like, getting to know each other uh, basically through music and vibing on that, like tone wise. And also talking about comedy, like the comedy bits and the when to toe that line of seriousness and comedy. So we were just having a lot of those discussions and going from there. I think like by the time we got to episode three, Bill was back by then and was like, okay, let's this, I feel like we're cementing into a style. Mm -hmm. So like by episode three, we kind of hit a groove and we're off and running from there. Yeah. Those conversations about music must have really paid off. I mean, you open with the Sex Pistols, next episode you have the jam, later on mm -hmm. Sam Cooke. I mean, the music in the series is great. So do you, do you actually get to ultimately decide what gets in there and then the music editor goes and finds it for you? 
Uh, yeah, we had a great music team um, who helped us, uh, you know, find a lot of these cues. And I think Jason has an incredibly ear for music. I mean, he said this to us, and I certainly sensed it. You know, he he doesn't necessarily know what we should put in, but he knows it when he hears it, and he knows that it's working. And uh, and he'll let us know as a yes that that cue is, uh, you know, is just uh, awesome. So yeah, but to go back to your your question, you know, I think I just called Mel up. Um, I, uh, we just wanted to talk on the phone and, and that's how we began it. Yeah, Cause I had not worked with Mel. So it was a phone conversation and, uh, you know, we just set a tone early on that we would, uh, always collaborate and always keep open line of communication with each other and, you know, share what we felt was, you know, working, what our successes were and also what our struggles were. And, you know, I just always made a point to check in, uh, which is important. And, uh, we went on a lot of walks, uh, Mel and I <laughs> yeah. and would talk. Because again, I just think we realized quickly that we weren't working, you know, on a on a comedy. It was, it was different. So it was about you know, how, how are you dealing with, uh, you know, these emotional scenes that just get very dramatic. You know, when you're not getting a traditional joke every, you know, thirty seconds or less, like a comedy would do. And uh, and we talked about strategies about you know when to you know play things in the close, when to play things in the wide. I think the, the strategy became, you know, when to pace up the show quickly and get the story out and get the, the jokes out and then when to let it chill. We should talk a little bit about the production, the handoff from production to post. You mentioned the show is shot over in London, but you guys are back in LA doing post. And it sounds like by the time you were on episode three, they were done with principal photography. Is that? No, no. It just, Bill had come back by the time I think we had three and then maybe he went back. Like, so Bill was back and forth working on cuts, but like, yeah, we definitely had three or four in the can. Maybe you were working on four AJ mm -hmm. and Bill had come back and we kind of went from there, but we pretty much kept it up to camera. So we were by ourselves before anybody really came back for a while. I mean, we, we were up to camera, but also uh, they were eager to try to get the first two or three episodes kind of edited in a place where they could show Apple. Um, yeah, we did fall behind by the uh, time. Yeah, of course. I will say that all the sports action was shot uh, last. And that was something that it's really great to be involved in that pre viz process, as they say. Uh, we kind of got to design all those uh, sports plays based on things that the writers had found on YouTube. So the two big sports episodes are episodes five and 10. And uh, I did 10 uh, and that crazy corner kick play, the, uh, the, the Sandman play where they, they kick it through uh, three players' legs and it's the fourth player who kicks the ball. Those were moments that um, uh, Brendan Hunt is a huge uh, soccer fan. And so yeah, I think he found a lot of these plays on YouTube and, and sent them over to us into productions. Like, can we recreate a lot of these plays? Uh, but Kip Kroger, our supervising producer, uh, went and commissioned a bunch of uh, sort of uh, cartoon animatics of players running around. And Mel and I would just laugh hysterically cutting this stuff as these goofiest stick figures. And when we would intercut them with real picture, it just became like we were cutting this ridiculous Warhol film. But we got to design uh, how that would work and how we would showcase. And we realized quickly that your instinct is to go into close-ups, but that's not how they film soccer. Soccer is always wide in a TV angle. It's different from how American football or, or baseball is shot where they go in close because there's, there, there's timeouts in American sports. And you don't have, there's no, in soccer, the clock is continuous. So it's always in a, a wide TV angle to this moves back and forth on the field. So it became a, uh, a moment for Mel and I to figure out how to incorporate you, when we can go to close-ups when we're in our player's world versus the TV world. Well, Mel, is it safe to assume that the episodes that involve a lot of in-game stuff or practice stuff, that component is more demanding? You have to set aside more time to try and make that all work? Oh, definitely. And I think that's kind of one of the things that like pushed us a little behind was, so yeah, when we were working, when I was working on five was the first time we really got real gameplay. And I just had the script in front of me and I got like a few animatics and then I was filling it out with, uh, like my assistant and I were looking through stock footage. We were looking through YouTube and it was like, okay, I need something. Somebody kicks it over. So I was like cutting, it would be like messy was thrown in there. And then like, stock footage of just like a random game so it was and we put title cards over the top you know uh roy kicks the ball and and then you know just so you know it's roy 
And yeah, we built all that and sent that to London and then it came back. So we kind of had like a, a, I had a blueprint, right? Of like, okay, I know this is going to be, we're going to be in the bar here. I had all those beats kind of worked out and then the footage came back and it was a whole different beast again, right? They shot everything slow motion. They shot a lot of extra stuff. I mean, I had all my beats and I think that was important for us, especially since there was a time limit for them to have like a blueprint, right? Get this bare minimum and we'll cover the scene. I think that opened them up for shooting, Kip said he saw the director there just kind of like checking off what he needed. And then they got some really beautiful just tracking shots. I remember five when they score, uh, spoiler alert, when Roy and Sam score the goal, I got the footage back and I, you know, I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to do all these quick cuts, right? And it's just one beautiful shot. Roy comes over the camera, kicks it across and the camera's kind of like low to the ground. It's field level, basically low, low angle, comes over the camera, kicks it. The two uh, defenders just sliding out and gets to Sam. Right. And I was like, this is just the shot. Like, I don't really need, I don't need to cut. Like, that's just beautiful. Like that's doing everything. And then they shot it in slow-mo. So I was able to speed ramp it and it was just so good. I had the assistant like kind of like strip down the sound there and everything there. I was just like, this moment's awesome. And then once it gets to Sam, then there's like three kicks into the goal, like three shots to get into the goal. Cause I was like, Oh, I like this kick. And then I like, I want to get here. Cause the goal, the ball hits in the middle of the thing. So then I did my fast cuts, but I was like that whole moment, they just nailed it in one take. It was like one of the easiest things actually I had, I had done. <laughs> But yeah, the, there was a lot of other stuff that really took some finessing because, you know, they're not professional soccer players. So we were hiding stuff. There was some body doubles, I won't mm-hmm. say where. And, you know, so it was like hiding that stuff. So mm-hmm. so there was some intricate stuff, but there was also some really great just camera movements and things that you could just just lay that in. Well, Mel, you reminded me of a question I wanted to ask you about a scene where, where Roy's niece, uh, Phoebe, kicks the ball in oh, Ted's right. face. Mm-hmm. Um, before I ask about that, though, I did want to ask AJ, you know, hearing Melissa talk about these different cameras to work with, angles to work with, a lot of the stuff shot, if not all the stuff shot in the locker room is handheld, mm. but then pretty much everything else, and also Ted's apartment is handheld, but pretty much everything else is is a fixed mm-hmm. or, you know, a jib or crane. Is there some kind of psychology at all? There's some kind of actual philosophy behind why you guys do that that way? There is a lot of uh, handheld uh, steady cam uh, in the show, and we, and we had a really great steady cam operator who did some wonderful moves. Um, there's one scene that comes to mind in, in 106, two aces, the team meeting scene, the so-called trash can scene, as I call it, where the team is um, uh, basically trying to rid the ghost that they think is haunting them. And so they're all throwing uh, personal items of sacrifice into the trash can. And Jason directed that scene, and the rig is in the center. It's just moving around the team. So that was a single camera scene. And the challenge there was to keep it fluid. I got to uh, edit Zach Braff's episode, who did episode 102. And I thought his uh, movement, you know, different directors did different things. Tom Marshall felt like his material was very locked, uh, uh, traditional. But, uh, you know, Zach came in and had some really fluid movements in and out of the scene that's important to try to preserve those. You know, he, and he anticipated some great things, like one scene would end with a tilt up and the next scene would tilt up into, into Rebecca's apartment. So it's uh, really wonderful when you have this kind of match movements to get in and out of a scene. And I think also Jason uh, gave us some notes sometimes to back off some of those crazy moves. And even in the Iverson scene, that Dutch angle just felt like a little different you know, for the show. So we do use it in key moments, but he doesn't want to always go to some of those, that crazy footage because for him, everything needs to be justified. Every cut and shot needs to be justified. I was going to say, I think too, in my idea of what maybe their discussions were about the handheld versus, I think the locker room and Ted at home are places of incredibly real moments. I mean, a lot of funny stuff happens. And I think maybe too in the locker room was a little bit like it would be easy for them to pan over because there's so many people usually in the locker room, right? And then they easily could switch switch over and we'd have very long takes. So, but I also think the handheld just leads to like documentary style just feels more real. And I know Jason's talked about this, like he wanted that locker room to be the defining thing of our show. Like it's the cheers bar. So I think he really wanted that to feel realistic energy to it. And I think that's why the handheld kind of went hand in hand with that. Speaking of the cheers bar uh, in the pub uh, on the wall, 
is a picture of a Native American man, which is the same picture from Cheers. There's a little homage. Yeah. And, uh, An Easter egg. Little Easter eggs. I mean, yeah, Ted's head is sort of stuck in the 90s <laughs> and the 80s. And uh, there's a funny joke in there, which is also improv, where everyone keeps saying the lasso, cheers, cheers, mate, cheers, cheers. And finally, after like the, the sixth time, he's like, night court. <laughs> you, you, you you wouldn't get that joke unless you were a TV reviewer. <laughs> um, also, I just wanted to mention to Mel's point about soccer. Uh, yes, our players are not uh, uh, professional soccer players, so we had to really work to cut around them. But I will say Phil Dunster, um, who plays Jamie Tart, what a great bit of casting because he's really a great actor and played that role perfectly, but he's also a solid soccer player. Uh, he must have played in, in his youth because there's one shot he does in that, which is just a one or take where he just bends it like Beckham into the back of the net. And, uh, I, no visual effects, just let that go. And I'm like, well, we're using that take. Danny Rojas is great too. And Danny Rojas, yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, if you don't have professional soccer players, at least you have professional editors. So, yeah. <laughs> well, there you so again, a lot of the elements of the show, I mean, you have the game stuff where they really probably can't give you much more than a, a beat sheet and you guys have to work through that, that animatic process. But also there's a lot of intercutting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a perfect example is something like in the pilot, Ted's introductory press conference. And I have the script right here. And there's really not much in the script compared to what's in the the amount of work that you had to do, which is often the case. Editors get, you know, there's a little script and it says all this great stuff happens. And um, so I'm just kind of curious about that element of it, Melissa, where it's just, you know, he's getting peppered with some questions from the reporters. It's being carried live on TV. Mm -hmm. And um, it just sort of builds into this sort of chaotic, very cutty. And you also introduce a sort of high pitched whine yeah. in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a puzzle. Uh, I, and that was one similar to a sports thing where I just knew, okay, I'm going to, I got to get this first cut out, right? Like I got to get this first version out and I just know I'm going to be massaging and massage. It's going to be something that I'm never going to be done working on, right? Like, because there were so many places to go. I had the guys in the bar, I had the players and we were, so we we're introducing different players and uh, there was a lot more material in there that what we ended up getting like we spent it was funny we would go to the locker room and have a big scene in it and then get back to the press conference so we did a lot of um paring down just to kind of keep things moving keep the energy up and i had all the report like different reporters and their reactions to him and it's yeah it was a fine dance of setting everybody up and playing those jokes the guys in the bar were hilarious but yeah, my first cut of that was, it was basically like, okay, I think the guys in the bar had a better reaction here than the guys in the team. And even though it was scripted to go to the team, like this wins. So I would do that. And then, yeah, we played around with how to set up those guys in the, in the, the team because we had Roy, we had Sam, and there was actually a longer Jamie bit and that ended up getting cut, but then we didn't see Jamie at all. And Jamie's so important. So then I, I was able to find just like a bit of, he's just doesn't even pay attention, you know, in the original cut, he comes around and they have a conversation. So I was trying to find, okay, I got to get Jamie in there. And then we get, we get back and we have to build, 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 build until he spits the water out. So yeah, that was a, it was a fine dance of playing all the beats, but still managing to stay in Ted's world. That was something Jason and I really worked on was the the cuts to the to the uh, journalists toward right before he spits the water was like okay let's just make it quick and we could do the the Dutch angle there was like a Dutch angle and everybody's we cut to the laughing there's a journalist who's laughing like it just gets more and more absurd until it's all broken when he spits out the water because of the bubbles. And then, yeah, Jason with the high pitched sound. I think we had, I'd already done that in seven by the time Jason and I were working on the pilot. And so we were like, oh, let's put that noise in again, but not have it as big as we have it in seven, right? When he's having this panic attack. So that was a lucky thing of having all the episodes kind of done where we could, someone we'd found in seven, we could bring back to the pilot and nothing's locked. So, Hey, what, let's, let's try that here. And we could actually build a more cohesive season with that sound picture, all of that. That idea of like, you realized, Hey, I haven't used Jamie much. You know, I'll ask editors all the time about how they organize story elements within the avid, within the timeline. Do you, do you keep track of things like that? Or do you use color coding? What sort of tricks do you employ? And I hate to use the word tricks, but what sort of methods I should say, do you employ to make sure that you're balancing certain things the way you need to, or do you're keeping track of all these different story beats? The show is very much a reaction show. And you want to see how Ted is playing on the other faces of the other characters. 
So it does become a strategy of how to, you know, balance and say, okay, well, we can go to cut away to Roy here, or to Jamie, or to Sam, or to Nate, and see uh, how it's playing on the other character spaces. There is uh, a lot of passes that Jason will do uh, uh, with us to make sure that there is sort of an, an arc and flow to the scene. And certainly with the speeches, uh, you know, he has some uh, great, great speeches he gives to the team and, and both of our episodes. So, you know, one that comes to mind is episode 10, uh, the finale. He comes out and talks about the saying, you know, it's a, you know, there's that saying, it's the hope that kills you. And he says, I disagree. I, I believe and believe. And so we, we, we really worked uh, with Jason to have a strategy of uh, how we cut to each side of the room. You know, when he makes a declarative statement, we would cut to one side of the room. And when he asks the questions like, do you believe in miracles? We would cut to the other side of the room. And you want to see how he's playing on the characters. So, yeah, with, with Jason very much, uh, it does need to build dramatically and in, in pacing and then kind of arc back down. I think um, for me, uh, like just thinking about how I organized that scene, flashing back to how I cut, especially in the press conference, I had so much footage, right? And so so I would make string outs. That's a lot of, and I'll have just like a bin of string outs. So then I'll have Roy, I'll have this player, I'll have the, guy, the guys in the bar, and I just kind of like string it out wide to tight. So I can just quickly get to that footage because a lot of times too, it would be, handheld so it'd be a move over here so you'd have a bit you would never know kind of like if you just looked in your bin it's like where was that shot where it panned over and you found and I could steal that little bit so like I would you know have string outs for organization like that of and then I could find easily find my cutaways when I was watching the show and being like you know what I do need Roy here let me go to that Roy string out and find something that would work well AJ you talked earlier about collaborating amongst the two of you and sharing material Technically, how are you connected? How do you go about that process? The first episode was cut, really rip, had a ripple effect with some things later. Uh, simply our characters in the bar. How they were introduced in episode one determined how I could use them in episode two when they're doing that wanker chant uh, to, the, to the TV because um, you know, there's a scene that probably got cut where they were, they were kicked out of the pub. And so they're, they're still chanting wanker, but from the outside through the window looking in, and, and that didn't get to make it in. So yeah, I think Mel's point that um, all episodes were open is a wonderful way to work. Like we didn't have to lock episodes one, two, three first. Uh, basically every single episode was left unlocked all the way through 10. And it wasn't until the very end of the season that we kind of knew, all right, you know, now we can start locking one, two, three. Uh, so that, that was a wonderful luxury to have and built into the schedule. Um, I tell people that there is a funny uh, sort of cliffhanger that was left dangling, if you will, a factoid that was left dangling in, in episode nine. Ted pitches a joke to Coach Beard. He's like, you know, what sound does a British owl make? And they're having a fight, so they never get to answer that in episode nine. And the plan was always answered in episode 10 in this kind of walk and talk shot that uh, had to get cut for timing. So the... Uh, you know, the Twitter went nuts because the, the question was never answered. Like, well, what sound does a British owl make? Uh, it's the last question on my sheet right here. The closer is, so what does a British owl say? The answer is whom? <laughs> whom? We'll have to come up with a new last question for you. Yeah, that thing about the guys in the bar, that was a running thing uh -huh. yeah. through episode three. Uh, because So they get kicked out in the pilot. Yeah. She kicks them out because they're rude to Ted. It's a scene mm -hmm. that actually was in, it was out, it was in, it was out. And we were just very long with the show and... And so we ended up taking it out. And um, so I was like, I would always be to AJ. I'd be like, they're in. Oh, nope, they're uh, out. Yeah. They're in. <laughs> nope, they're out. Like, so, so he's like taking in and yeah. out from two. And then in three, she invites them back in. At the very end of three, Ted's walking through the town. And he comes across the three guys in the bar. And they're outside. And then at the end of that scene, uh, May, the bar owner, comes out of the door and says, all right, you guys can come back in. So then when they ultimately get out and it's all this ripple effects and AJ's like, I can't use them in two. And then I was like, yeah, she comes out at the end of that scene. So it's actually like a split screen and I freeze framed the door. So the bar mm -hmm. door never opens. And like, luckily the guys are in one corner. So it was like, I, I was able to end the, the beat. Cause I was like, I can't, I want to stay in this shot for the end shot. Like, it's just like, you need to see kind of their reaction. So it was like a split screen with a, a V effect in there. Just, to keep the continuity. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
We have a lot of those uh, tricks that we could use. It's about keeping a bin of versions, uh, you know, at the ready because there can be so many different ways to go. I just want to say that um, my sense is that this was Jason Sudeikis' uh, probably most involved experience in, in the cutting room uh, compared to perhaps some of his other movies and TV projects. Um, just because he really, uh, I could sense that he was very kind of in awe when he first kind of came in and saw the power of the Avid, uh, you know, he loved that we could use, you know, the fluid morph tool to pull up pacing between lines and then hide a jump cut. Uh, he loved uh, the ability to resize and reframe shots. As Mel also mentioned, speed ramping. We did a lot with the action scenes. Um, so we just kind of developed a shorthand between me, Mel and Jason. We was like, you know, when we were kind of stuck in a cut and it wasn't quite working, he's like, you know, what, what, what movie magic could we do here? You know, he kind of, said it in that Ted Lasso voice as though Ted was uh, experiencing a nonlinear editing for the first time. So uh, <laughs> yeah. really amazing to work with him. Well, if he ever wants to do a Ted Lasso avid editor promo, you let me know and we'll... Oh, Ted would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he would. He really did love the editing process. Yeah, very involved. He was very yeah. involved. Mm -hmm. Him and Bill kind of tag team. Yeah. You know, Jason had such a great vision for the show mm -hmm. and for the characters. And so he was very involved. And in different ways. We got to work with them in the room. And then when we had to leave the Warner Brothers lot in the pandemic and we got to move the whole show to Evercast and Zoom, it became very fun to be you know, Zooming with uh, Jason Sudeikis all day long. Yeah. That must be a little surreal to be cutting an actor for so many, for such a, whatever period of time. Then all of a sudden they're sitting next to you in the room, giving you their thoughts on the cut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It was great for ADR lines because I have this little ADR record, like sound recorder, and he'd be like, "Oh, I'll do that real quick for you," and come over. Yeah, and, yeah. and you don't think that it's that the voice is that different, but it is. Like from how he he talks, he puts on the Ted Lasso thing. Mm -hmm. it was, I was like, "Awesome!" Now we don't have to have I don't have to go over to AJ and say, "Hey, they want this line. Can you do it?" <laughs> and, yeah. and there was there was one line that he was like, "I think I nailed it. I actually don't want to do that in ADR." So they used uh, one of the ADR lines in the final mm -hmm. final mix. Um, and no ego, too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It was really a joy to work with him. Yeah. Well, you talked about um, you know fluid morph and split screens and doing some visual sleight of hand. Oh, yeah, splits. Yes, that was another thing that he loved that we could like create a reaction by splitting two shots together. You know, it's on Apple TV, so you can just imagine there's a lot of iPhones and iMacs. And so that for you guys, that means there's going to be a lot of screen replacements, some tracking mm -hmm. uh, and all the other tricks that you guys talked about. Does that really fall to you to do? Is that something you trust to your assistants? Is a VFX editor to do that? Where does that responsibility lie on Ted Lasso? Uh, my assistant, Alex, was wonderful. We had to figure out all, all those laptops came in blank. And they really tell the story, like what Rebecca is looking at is a great visual device. And we know that she's been divorced from her husband and he's been cheating on her with other women. And, uh, and also there's a, you know, there's a great reaction at the beginning and the, when they lose their first match in the end of two and the internet is just going nuts with on Twitter saying fire lasso. And she kind of smiles like her plan is working. There was one in, um, episode seven where Ted's having a conversation with his son on FaceTime and the footage came in and I was like, Ooh, where's the, uh, where's the Ted Lasso on the iPhone. So when I cut to the laptop and they didn't get that. So that is actually Ted's close up. And so my assistant, I was like, just try to build the beats from the audio pieces I was using. But when I would go to that laptop, a lot of times I was pulling up stuff. So she was doing fluid morphs for the little Ted box in the corner. So she was doing fluid morphs to get the sentences to line up. And then, yeah, then we sent it to the VFX house. So that was fun. Um, we didn't do any like the background replacement. And then the VFX, when they got there and they got real specific, like Ted's background became a Kansas City barbecue. Yes, uh, yeah. Jason wanted to add that in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was like fun things that, you know, we would kind of do the story beats of it, get that all set up, and then they would we'd send that off to VFX um, yeah. for them to make amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the sound effects of the iPhones were, were key. Uh, there, there was one where Jason said, you know, let, let's get a, uh, you know, where that young kid is in the opening on the plane with Ted. He, he appears. The Aussie at, kid. The Aussie kid. Yeah. The Aussie. Yeah. He appears at the end and, uh, and he does a, uh, a selfie with Jamie Tart and, Jason was like, you know, can we make, can we use that burst effect where it takes you know, many, many shutter speeds? So it's unfortunately, you know, uh, a lot of those are available online and Apple sent over all those legit sound effects. So 
Both of you have um, talked about going from wide to close or vice versa for, for some kind of effect, generally comedic. You know, Mel, I was asking you earlier about the scene. I believe this is one, one that you cut where Roy Kent's niece, Phoebe, she's playing ball with, with Ted and she kicks the ball into his face. Mm -hmm. And it's a wide shot and you see the ball travel all the way to his face and then you cut close and sort of step back a little bit so it sort of doubles. Mm -hmm. And this is something you kind of see a lot in action films and i was just wondering if that was something that you and aj talked about in terms of stylistically when you know for for beats like that do you want to follow a certain method pattern whatever you want to call it that actual moment actually like yeah I'd cut how it played was how i cut it in the editor's cut and then i think the director was like can we just stay in the wide but it didn't have quite the impact right and and the and it really did look like it hit him in that close so we we ended up like going back to just the impact of it. Like you just felt it viscerally a little bit more when you got into that close up. Uh, Jason would ask a lot, is there a rule here for this? Mm -hmm, and yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I would say like, you know, sometimes he'd ask, Oh, could we, we cut on this line? And I was like, Oh, I, you know, would like to have them finish the, finish the sentence, you know, like and I'd flash to like a mentor editor being, you know, being like, Ooh, upcutting. Are we, you know, like somebody that was going to critique my work. But then other times I was like, you know, I think at this moment is about what we're feeling, right? Like at the end of the pilot, he's having that conversation with his wife on the phone and it's just a one-sided conversation. When I went into the close, basically for that, I because it was one-sided, I didn't have anywhere else to cut the room besides him. I had a wide, I had a medium, and then I had an AB of kind of like close and then even closer. And I decided to save that big, big close, the closest that I could get right on the beat change of that scene when you realize, oh, like, this isn't a happy marriage. Like, he says, oh, well, what did I say? And you don't hear what she's saying, right? And then, and then there's like, you, you fill in the blank of what's said on her end. And then I cut to that close and he very close. And he's like, well, that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you that space. And I remember, line. yeah, and, and you realize in that moment, like, that's why he's in London. That it, it opens up so many things and you realize, oh, there's pain in this guy, right? And so that's why it was really important to save it till that close. And I remember Jason being like, we played where we went to the close in there. He's like, maybe it should be a little bit earlier. And he's like, well, no, now this doesn't have quite the same impact. And then when I thought about it, and that was actually something I worked on a show called I Love Dick, which uh, was a Jill Soloway show. And I was the assistant on that. And I talked to the editor a lot about that scene because that was all about performance in there. And Jill Soloway's big thing was, I want to see the beat change on camera. I want to, you know, I want to live in that beat change of the scene. Where's the beat change in the scene? And that always stuck with me. And so I explained that to Jason. And he was like, okay, yeah, let's go on that line then. Let's make that line where we go into close and because he was because he was always like you know why did you do this and and i explained that story and i was like the beat change and he was like oh okay like he went once he knew why you were doing what you were doing usually he was like oh okay yeah let, let's i like that or sometimes he'd be like okay i get that but let's do this you know like he was very open to collaboration in that way mm -hmm. you know generally you want to start a scene your instinct i think as an editor is to start a scene why because you're in a new place and you want to establish where we are but sometimes there is a, you know, kind of a good esoteric kind of a beauty of starting close. You know, one things that comes to mind is, you know, coming in close and Rebecca taking a bite of the biscuit at the top of the scene and then revealing where we are later. Uh, so there's some mystery to that. Yeah, Jason would, would always often ask that question, you know, what's the rule here? Because he is a huge film buff and um, you kind of feel like you're in a Sudeikis film school a bit with him because he's really just got a big library in his head and so many movies that he's seen. You know, I know he wanted uh, the opening of the pilot to have that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid feel where we kind of, you know, introduce sort of the second character, Rebecca, first. You know, he showed me, uh, he sent over a link to uh, Sylvester Stallone's Escape to Victory, which is a great soccer sports uh, movie, you know, so that we had those references, you know, what a great, you know, Friday Night Lights and just kind of great iconic sports films, you know, so we could have an homage. But yes, definitely, I think just feeling in the performance and he, and he wants to know, you know, what was your intention for this? Why did you choose this take? I would usually have a response to that. You know, this is the one that I, I felt the most or I laughed at the most. And, you know, oftentimes he'd agree, but then he would say, well, you know, what other messages of the characters are we trying to get here? 
so to get a better sense of how things might evolve organically in the cutting room, it seems that, you know, Jason and Bill are very collaborative and, and trust a lot to you. We talked earlier about the script, what's in the script versus what ends up on the screen. There is a scene, again, the episode might be four. It's the Trent Krim episode where um, basically there's there's a sequence where a reporter spends the day with Ted and, and the feeling is that it's going to be a very critical article about Ted. And Higgins, Becca's assistant, reports back to her about the article. He's got an advanced copy of it and he's reading it. But as he's reading it to her, you're following Ted. So it's almost like a voiceover following Ted going through town and, you know, the townspeople reacting to him. And then also part of it, the voiceover transitions from Higgins to the actor playing Trent Krim. So there's a lot going on and what's on the page, probably a very simple element. So I'm just, as a fan, just kind of curious how that sequence scene evolved. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, so that music at the end was scripted that, uh, Vivaldi piece and God, yeah, that was just a, um, I had the bit of Higgins. So I remember that I had the little sound bites. So I broke up the little sound bites and then I was like trying to match what was the sound bites of the article that he's reading to kind of what was happening visually Speaking of starting in a wide and going close, I'm a big proponent of starting close and going wide. Like, I love Mm, that. No, me me too. A fun piece of trivia, too, is so we start on the phone ringing, right, of the scene, and and the music starts right on that. I'm like, okay, let's get right. And we're in Rebecca's apartment. And originally on the phone, it said Higgins. But earlier in that episode... She uh, she says, hey, Suri, call shithead. And it goes to Higgins. So Higgins is in her phone as shithead. And I remember watching one of the cuts and with my assistant. And I was like, oh, wait, shouldn't her phone say shithead? Because Higgins is calling. And I remember being like, uh, not to add a visual effect, but I think we need to do this. And so that was a big, oh, my Suri is asking. Sorry, could you repeat what you said? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> plug, an Apple plug in the podcast. Yeah, sorry. She's, she's always listening. Um, anyways, so, so that was a fun V effect and we, we kept getting it back and I'm like, can you read, can you read shit hit on that? Like that was a few V effects back and forth, but I digress. So then, so you, um, bu- I built from there just the beats and we go to the club, we see the team where he's, how he's affected Roy. And, uh, I think we, yeah, we, we were able to add some dialogue and then some places I was you know, shortening sentences. And I remember doing a lot of music editing in that scene too, because there's a scene where Roy uh, headbutts a player and I was like, oh, the music has this perfect like build and then sustain and then builds back up again. And I was like, okay, I have to like, after that, I think the music has to have that part where it falls back for the headbutt. And then after the headbutt is like, the music comes back in, the classical music comes back in and, and, you know, kind of like the chaos in the club after that. And the build where you realize, oh, this article is going to turn out nice. You think the article is going to be bad. And there's a turning point. The music turns. And so, yeah, that was a lot of crafting there, but with wonderful performances. And, yeah, just figuring out the coolest, best visual way to hit all those beats with what the article was saying. And then ending on her kind of like realizing, oh, my plan isn't working. And she says like, shit and falls back. That was a lot of like, working on the music and the dialogue and when to transfer to to Trent because that came later. So the first cut of it was all Higgins. And then finally I was able to get the Trent Krim. I think we had my assistant like asked uh, the the script supervisor, can you get that um, from Philip for for three in a wild line? Um, And eventually we got, I think we got that. So I was able to craft the rest of it, but that was a, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great, like I said, I think when we got to three, it was like clicking, right? We kind of, we had done all the setup of what the story was going to be about. And we were just able to play by the time we got there. But yeah, that was, uh, thank you for mentioning that scene. I <laughs> reflashing back to how I was cutting it. And was like, oh yeah, that was a really fun sequence to cut. Well, you guys had a lot of fun stuff to do. Um, yeah. You know, AJ, earlier when I was asking you guys about the fact that you had never worked together before and the discussions you had meeting one another, <clears throat> you can't help but notice that in your collective uh, CV, resume, IMDb, whatever you want to call it. You worked on Rock of Love. <laughs> Melissa, you worked on Rock of Love Charm School. I mean, I have to imagine at some point you discussed that shared experience. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we, we, maybe. We, we come, yeah, I mean, coming from the, I came from the unscripted world, and I think uh, that absolutely helps in, uh, in a scripted uh 
the show, certainly that type of, uh, you know, being able to kind of flow with uh, options and being able to you know, have different versions and to deal with improv. Uh, and especially on a show like Lasso, which has just a very strong script, but, you know, we, we often, they were rewriting the script over in production. So we didn't often see the, you know, get the final scripts until, you know, things would, things would change. So, uh, having that, uh, unscripted sensibility helps certainly in a lot of scenes, uh, cutting the show. Um, you know, one scene that comes to mind is the, uh, the trick plays scene in 110 where the team is just throwing out a bunch of names for trick plays and kind of balancing, you know, keeping that, insanity going of them all bouncing around the room and then putting it to the, the Harlem Globetrotters theme, the sweet George Brown song that, uh, you know, so, so there, there are moments of the show that do feel very unscripted. Of course, they're very much scripted on set and they have a, a good intention, but there is a, certainly a magic that happens that I don't think they always know where the moments are going to go. So there, there is, does feel like that having an unscripted, background does bring, you know, an element of, you know, being fresh. I'm kind of happy about the Ted Lasso is such a hit because now people are reaching out to me about that show. But usually if like somebody from my high school is like, oh, you're working in television now and they like look me up on IMDb, all they want to talk about is Charm School and Rock of Love. And I'm like, (laughs) I've done so many other things since (laughs) I'm hoping Ted Lasso takes (laughs) over that. (laughs) Right. You can't put in all those years on Rock of Love and not get something good out of it towards the end. Yes. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say that people are going to be asking them more about Ted Lasso than Rock of Love from here on out. The show is renewed for two more seasons, so you can add that to the list of things we're all looking forward to, or to which we all look forward, either one. My thanks to Melissa and AJ for taking us into the mind of Ted Lasso. They also sent over some timeline shots and some really cool behind-the-scenes pictures of them and their friends. So if you ever wanted to see what it was like to have a Zoom meeting with Jason Sudeikis, head on over to the Rough Cut YouTube channel to check that out. Link in the show notes, as always. You heard how Ted Lasso loves that movie magic you can do with Avid Media Composer? I know you'll love it too, so get your editing kicks for free with Media Composer first, or grab a monthly or yearly subscription to the same tools that Melissa and AJ use in Avid Media Composer. Okay, we're out of stoppage time for this match of the Rough Cut. It ended in a tie. We all won because we got to meet Melissa and AJ. So who will we meet out on the pitch next week? I don't know. Subscribe to the podcast and find out. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.